Thank you, Rick and Nancy. Luke chapter 2, we'll begin where we left off this morning in verse 21. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. Of course, the Christmas story does not end when the shepherds go away. I would say the entire book of Luke is the Christmas story because the whole story of what Jesus is all about. Several times as we talk about the book of Luke and I look at the introduction of the book of Luke, I've mentioned that before, that Luke specifically mentions that he paid attention to the details when he was writing this account to the man called Theophilus. Luke includes some details in the Christmas story and in this passage of scripture. And I'm going to entitle uh, tonight's message just simply Luke's eloquent details. The word eloquent means clearly expressing or indicating something. There's some details three different details we're going to look at this evening that express quite a bit. They seem to be maybe some minor details that you might overlook, uh, but you have to watch Luke because he does that. He puts some details in there that you might read over until you do a little bit of homework and find out. He said a mouthful in just a few sentences. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, would you stand as the scriptures read, please? And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples to bring light, the light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them. And said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that will be spoken against. Yes, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being able to gather in your house, and I thank you for all that have taken the time to come. I ask that you would bless your word as we share it here, and as others may be listening on their computer that, Father, your word would speak to us. We know it accomplishes your purpose, and we trust your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Verse 22 and 23 tells us of something that had to be done, and this was done in the temple, which turned out that them being in Bethlehem was actually a good thing. It was about 40, 30 to 40 days after Jesus was born, the law of Moses, specifically in the book of Leviticus chapter 12, every male child was to be presented to the Lord along with an offering. This offering was to be a lamb and a pigeon, or a lamb and a turtle dove. Look at Luke's detail. According to the day, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, 
a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, if you read through the book of Leviticus in the first few verses, chapter 12, it says you bring a lamb and a turtle dove or a lamb and a pigeon. Now, Luke makes sure he lets people know they brought two turtle doves or two pigeons because if you continue reading in the book of Leviticus, if a family cannot afford to bring a lamb for this particular sacrifice, they are allowed to bring another pigeon and another turtle dove. So instead of a lamb and a turtle dove, they brought two turtle doves or two pigeons. He could have just said that they came and did according to the law of Moses, every male should be presented to the Lord, but he made sure to let people know that they presented two pigeons. You see, the substitute offering of the pigeon instead of the lamb was known as the offering of the poor among the Jews. And Luke wanted to be sure that all of humanity knew that the parents of Jesus Christ, when they came to do according to the law, were obedient to the law, but they had to give the offering of the poor because they could not afford a lamb. When the Lamb of God came into the world and God chose a family to bring Jesus Christ into the world to foster him as he grew, he chose a home that had to give the offering of the poor to identify with the fullest of human struggles. He did not come to a well-to-do, affluent influential family. He came into a family that was at that particular time was homeless. They eventually had a home in Bethlehem, but at that time they were so poor they had to give the offering of the poor. Luke, of course, wanted to be sure that we all knew when Jesus Christ came to live among humanity, he totally immersed himself into all the struggles of humanity. He knew what it was like to bring up, to be brought up in a home where hard work was uh, the rule and you had to watch what you spent, and you, and you had to watch, of course, every penny, and he knew, of course, what it was to deal with the human struggles that we all faced with. In verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, when we opened up, of course, our look at the Christmas season with Zacharias in the temple, and we said, rightfully so, it had been 400 years since God had spoken openly to the people of Israel through a prophet. However, God never ceased to communicate with those who would listen. It says quite clearly, God was speaking to people with individuals, and the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. That meant that God was communicating with individuals, maybe not with, this, with the whole country like as with through a prophet, but for those who would listen. You see, the normal Hebrew mindset was this. Yes, they were looking for the Messiah to come, the normal Hebrew mindset said he would be a political and a military warrior. He would bring about a political victory. He would chase out the Romans or the Greeks, whoever was in control at the time, and bring about a glorious nation of Israel where all the glory would come to their nation. The nation would get glory. The nation would be powerful, and all the people of the world would be subdued under the hands of the Hebrews. That's what they believed. But then there were the others. They were called the quiet in the land. The quiet in the land were those who were praying for the salvation of Israel and praying for the coming of the Messiah who would bring spiritual redemption. Their lives were spent in quiet service to the Lord and fastings and prayers. It is said that Zacharias and Elizabeth were of the quiet in the land. 
If you remember when he said, fear not, Zacharias, your prayer is heard, he not only talked to him about the fact that a son would be born, their personal struggles, but he started talking to them about the Redeemer who would come, and this child would be a forerunner. They didn't have any dreams of violent political power. They just waited patiently and in constant prayerfulness. You know, Isaiah had something to say about this. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. In the 46th Psalm, verse 10, the psalmist says, Be still and know that I am God. You see, Israel needed the quiet in the land. Israel needed those people in the chaotic days that they were facing. Our country needs those people in our country today. Oh, how we need the quiet in the land who in quiet confidence are prayerfully serving God and waiting on God. Paul even admonishes us for that. If you'll look in 1 Timothy chapter 2, First Timothy chapter 2, therefore, in verse 1, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications and prayers and intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. I exhort that we are to be praying people, prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks and supplications, that we'd be a praying people and that we would lead a quiet and peaceable life. He said this is good and acceptable in God's eyes because he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, which means there's a world that needs to be reached with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is not going to be reached with a message of abrasiveness and harshness, but we lead quiet and peaceable lives and share the love of Jesus Christ with others. This all ties in with what we see with Simeon. Simeon then begins to talk. And he says this in verse 29, Lord, you're now letting your servant depart in peace. It says before then, he took the baby Jesus in his arms. You're letting your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people Israel. Oh, he said a mouthful there. He said, in that one sentence, that the Savior that came to the world would not be exclusively for the Jewish people. He would bring the revelation to the Gentiles. Now here's what's important about this detail. Simeon had something to say because he was quiet and listened to God. The world needs the message of the gospel. The world needs the message of hope. And when we are quiet and prayerful, and if we would join that group known as the quiet in the land, we'll have something to say that the world needs to hear. And then the third detail that he gives us in verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widow of about 84 years. He, she did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day, and coming in at that instant gave thanks to the Lord. Listen to this. Listen to this detail. And spoke of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. You know what he's saying there? She knew that redemption would come through this baby. 
That's a lot to say in just a few words. And she spoke to everybody who was looking for that redemption. What's the detail there? God uses another unexpected messenger. For the Hebrew leadership and the average Hebrew man, for God to use a shepherd to broadcast the wonderful news of the coming Messiah was just so totally unexpected to them. And now God is using a woman. It would be totally unexpected. They wouldn't expect that. They wouldn't expect that a very humble widow would be the next messenger to speak of everybody who's looking for redemption. But you see, that's the eloquent detail that Luke brings about. Never second guess who or what God can use. He can use what we can do. He can use what we have to reach the world to all that are looking for redemption. And those are Luke's eloquent details. Is there any word before we close? If not, let's stand to be dismissed with a word of prayer.